in this series of order in the house, my goal is to say, let's look at the heavenly model. And if I could get some help, Jason, you please hand those out. I, I've been on the run today, and so I had to print this out from, a, from my email. But um, as we go along, I like to make sure everybody's got handouts. I want to do my notes for you. Uh, we'll also make this available, as we have in the past, electronically on the web. This isn't being streamed tonight, and I know that there's people right now trying to figure out what's wrong with their computer because they thought it was going to be streamed, but we're really, you know, we're just getting organized around here. Good thing is, is praise God for Adam and everybody because we're getting it YouTubed, and now, now it's documented on another level. And uh, the last time, it could only be audio. This time, it's actually going to be video. And if there's anything we really want to help people with is we want to help them with their relationships. Um, I'm just going to say this. Wrong relationships are not appropriate. They will not ever work. Period. Do not try to fix a wrong relationship. You can't. It's got to be set upon the right course. It's got to be a right relationship. And then now that right relationship can be fixed. Right relationship can be developed. Right, right relationship can grow. Um, Right relationship can mature. If everybody would recognize in a marriage, um, I still cannot believe how immature I am. To be very honest with you, I just really, a lot of my prayer time is, Lord, why am I so immature? <laughs> and um, a lot of my immaturity is centered around my lack of humility. And um, I have to recognize that I'm going to get humility from the same source that I get love from. I'm going to get humility from the same source that I get joy from. If I know how to receive joy and walk in joy, if I know how to receive peace and walk in peace, I'm going to get humility there too. All relationships ba are based on humility. Now let me just say this. <laughs> if you want a visual for humility, the best visual that I know for humility is you're moldable. You're like a soft, moldable clay in the hand of the potter. That's humility. You're not hard. You're not resistant. You're not drying up. You're staying real moldable. And in view of that, you've got to understand divine principle. We all have to. And so, you know, the, the, the divine principle that the Lord has laid out for us, the order that God has laid out for us cannot be circumvented. That has to be established first. Yeah, you on a personal basis want to recognize, hey, I want to, I want to be developed emotionally as much as I want to be developed intellectually. I want to learn how to live by principle because in those moments where I feel that I'm wrong and things are out of hand and I'm ready to just basically give somebody a piece of my mind and straighten everybody out here and let them know how I was in the right and they in the wrong, stop. That's not the principle. The principle is for us to love, for us to lay down our life, for us to bless. The Lord shows us how to deal with every person, no matter who they are. Enemies, love them. How? Bless them, don't curse them. I know how to deal with my enemies. So there is abs, principle will keep me. That's the word of God. That is wisdom. That's the insight. That's father's behavior. He's saying, if you want blessed results, do what I'm doing. Here, let me show you what I'm doing. You, the Proverbs, it's got the Proverbs has 30 chapters of this, right? 31 chapters of this, of information on us to know, for us to clearly understand what God's doing and what he's not doing, okay? The Bible is a description of what Father's doing, and there's principle over and over again that apply every day. Now, I'm going to let the principle keep me. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do to my neighbor. I know what I'm supposed to do to my neighbor. And who is my neighbor? Anybody that I run into, just like the Samaritan ran into the Jewish guy wounded in a, uh, on the side of the road and took care of him, okay? I know, what am I supposed to do? I'm loving him as myself, okay? What am I supposed to do to the household of faith, God's people, the people in the church? What am I supposed to do? I am supposed to love them like Jesus loved them. Is there ever an exemption? Is there ever an escape clause? Is there ever a possibility that I don't have to do these three things I just named? One for my enemy, one for my neighbor, and the other for the household of faith. Absolutely not. You can choose to, 
But you're going to always get the bad result. You're going to always get exactly what you don't want. The product is going to ultimately blow up in your face. It isn't going to work out well for you. You're not going to be blessed. You're not going to have the approval, the favor of the Father. He loves us. He loves us. There's no question about that. He loves the whole world, but the whole world doesn't have a relationship with him. If we love Christ Jesus, then the Lord says, then the Father will love us. In other words, we've been brought into a, a, a kind of love that's relationship love, not just a love that I have a compassion for you and I want something better for you, but you're not, you know, a part of the family. But I still love you. There's an opportunity. Then the relationship love, now that we are involved in, what a blessing that we have this relationship love. we got to understand the rules of it and understand, well, I want to please the Father. <clears throat> my, all my behavior, really, number one, is first isn't how am I interacting with my spouse? How am I interacting with the Father? Women, let me just tell you something. You don't have to defend yourself. you got a dad that will defend you greatly. But as long as you're defending yourself with your husband where you think that he's un being unjust, you're going to, fathers, you're just saying, you're shutting father out. You're saying, I don't trust you, dad. I don't believe that you're going to take care of me. I'm going to tell you, women, you are father's daughter. And he has a special care for his daughters. As any father has a protective care for his daughters. Father, I guarantee you, has a protective love. And you can trust him. He's going to straighten out your leader. Just trust him. Don't take it into your own hands. If you, if you want Father's favor, you want his favor, you're in relationship with him. Now, do you want his favor? Because I look at people constantly doing the wrong thing, and they want Father's favor. Father's favor is going to cause promotion. It's going to cause blessing. It's going to cause honor. It's going to cause riches. It's going to cause a wonderful, heavenly, good life. Do you want Father's favor? If you want Father's favor, then you're going to have to be willing to, to do what's right. You're going to have to be willing to obey his rules, to obey his orders. He knows how life works. He's the only one who knows how life works. You walk into a doctor's office. You say, Doc, I'm having this kind of ache, and I'm having this kind of pain. I'm having this kind of symptom. And you sit down there trusting that the doctor really knows how your body works and that he has the remedy to fix you. He really doesn't. He knows some of what you need, but he's, and he's going to use what we call you know, clinical science, which is a wonderful educated guess based upon a whole lot of information, right? And you're put fully trusting him to help you and, and praise God, many times it works out and you get helped and you feel better and everybody's happy, you know? But the reality of it is, Father really understands how to fix us. He understands how life works. This is what you gotta do. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you men, I'm going to tell you women, I'm going to tell you husbands, I'm going to tell you wives. Wrong relationships are not appropriate. <clears throat> to submit to wrong relationships is wrong, period. We want God's relationships that he has for us. So what I'm saying is now, when you walk down the aisle, okay, and you gave your life to one another, you committed a vow to each other, and in this vow... If you were, came and sat in a meeting with me, we went through a whole lot of disclosure. And everybody said, yes, 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 I'll do that. Yes, I want that. I agree. Everybody wants to have a marriage made in heaven. Everybody. But, but the problem is, is there is a cost to having a marriage made in heaven. And you know what the cost is? You got to keep it in heaven. What happens when all of a sudden you're just finished with the vows and you decide, you know, I don't want to do any of those things. I, I disagree with all those things. I'm not going to do it. Well, now you got yourself, you're in some serious hot water here because how, how is this relationship going to work? Because you vowed to one thing and now you're saying you want to do the opposite thing. No, we're going to have to come back and recognize that this isn't an arbitrary opinion of what we're going to do. We all agreed we are going to do it God's way. Okay? Now, if we would all live by that, every one of you would live happily ever after, and you would never need to go to order in the house or have any kind of marital counseling for the rest of your life. It would be fixed. 
I never needed marital counseling. My wife took care of me. I'm, I'm then just laying it down to you folks. I believe a woman is a centerpiece of life and happiness and well-being that she is literally the backbone of structure, morality, everything that is good. If she is a woman of God who gives herself to walking in divine principles, otherwise she will pluck down her house with her own hands. Because why? She wants to do it her way and she doesn't want to do it God's way. Are you with me? Okay. So, everybody wants to have a marriage made in heaven? Well, there's a price to pay. You got to keep it in heaven. The only way you're going to keep it in heaven is that you're going to have to be willing to do exactly what God said to do. In, I, I give you a, it's hard to see, but all the way down in section two here in the outline under the model is Christ, uh, model, the model is Christ and his church. I, I, I want to just point out something. There is a link there. And this link is from one of the world's uh, modern, you know, latest and greatest leaders in the feminist movement, which is one of the great enemies of proper relationship in the home. And I gave you this link, and I'm just going to quote, Our society neuters boys of maleness at a young age. This is a professor, Philadelphia. She's a feminist. She is a, she's a, she is a feminist on the level of a dis, dis, dissident feminist, okay? She is a, in other words, she is a militant feminist. And she is describing why our society is disintegrating and why we don't, why we have such high divorce rates and why things aren't working in our culture anymore. And she says, our culture doesn't allow women to know how to be womanly. Reality of it is, is that's what society and culture has done. It's created a whole new reference point and framework of relationship. It's redefined roles and responsibilities. And as far as you know, that's exactly what you've been, you're supposed to do because you've been molded and shaped by your society and by your culture. I'm all the time saying, dear people, stop with the culture thing. I'm really not interested in the culture thing. I'm interested in the kingdom of God culture and I want to bring to you the kingdom of God culture. And where do we get that from? We get that from doing exactly what Jesus did and observing exactly what Jesus said. And what he did is he came in the volume of the book from Genesis 1-1, from in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, to Revelation 22-21, uh, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. He came in the volume of the book. Okay, and if we're going to, if this is going to work right, if men are going to be allowed to be men, you know how men get to be men? They get to be men because women let them be men. Women let them be men. Women empower men. Women, listen, it, 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 you can't get that if you don't really understand the model. And, 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 and you're going to misunderstand me right now if you don't understand the model. So I'm going to back up and I'm going to give you the model so you really get it. As long as you are fighting your husband, he cannot be a man. A man who is the leader can never create an argument. You women created every argument that ever existed in your house. It was never your husband's fault, not one single time, because by virtue of the fact that he's the leader, you vowed to empower him as a leader, and he says, this is what we're going to do, let me lead. There's no way he can argue with himself. You have to say, no, I disagree. Now the argument begins. huh? Now all of a sudden, it breaks down and begins to disintegrate into the things that many households have, strife, you don't care about me. Understand this, a you don't care about me phrase is totally, by definition, demonic. Why? Satan is the grandiose manipulator. That's who he is. He manipulates everything. He creates compromise. He creates compromise through manipulation. He creates discord through strife. And strife, much of the time, is really a, a product of manipulation. Understand, dear people, 
you want to go ahead and grab a hold of the reality that you don't want to let this word of God depart out of your mouth. You, you want to learn how to listen to only the voice of the Holy Spirit. And to do that, you begin to live by the word of God. Now, you know, we're doing School of the Spirit on every other Friday night. One of the first and foremost things that I'm going to help people by the help and the grace of God to get is to know how to flow in the gift of discerning of spirits. Because when you understand that, your life begins to really take on a whole new different beauty and dimension. And you never even get to start doing that until you start learning to live by the Word of God. Which means then you're going to fundamentally begin to pull down a whole lot of strongholds and deal with a whole lot of imaginations that prior to that you just let run wild in your mind, run wild in your thinking, and it pollutes all of your ability to discern. It messes up all of your insight. It messes up all of your hearing because it's mixed. It's mixed. But when you begin to every day give yourself in a practical living way, I'm living by the word. I'm not having that bad attitude. I'm not having that bad thought. I'm not having that accusation. I'm not having that slander. I'm not having that suspicion. I'm not having that criti criticism. All of these things are what Satan is doing. All of those things are coming out of a realm of darkness. We've got to recognize, dear people, we've got an atmosphere. And that atmosphere, Paul tells us, that Satan is the god of this world. He, he is the prince and the power of the atmosphere. <laughs> and we've got to be careful. And, and someone said uh, to me not so long ago, and it was actually my daughter, she said, Dad, why is it so easy for so many people to slip over into a realm of darkness and go deep in darkness quick? Whereas we see so many, so few Christians really step over into the realms of the spirit and go deep into the realms of the spirit quick. I said, well, listen, let's look at the world around us. If our world had on every television program, on every movie, on every radio broadcast, the things of the Spirit, the things relating to walking with God and walking in the Spirit and knowing God and bringing the beauty and the splendor of who He is and what He is, right down every day into our lives. If all of our organizations and our businesses and our academics and all of our society was centered around the wonders and the goodness of the life of God, then what we would be able to do is easily go slip right over into that realm and go very, very deep in God quickly. Unfortunately, where we're at in our society... We have just the opposite situation going on. And in many respects, the church has lost its authority to influence. We're like sitting down in a corner waiting for the world to give us permission to start influencing the world again. Guess what? The world will never give anybody permission who belongs to God to do anything. Satan's going to try to keep you in the corner. Somebody's got to get authority and power and step up and say, no, 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 no. This is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to act. This is how we're going to dress. This is how we're going to live. Oh, you're trying to control me and dictate things to me. Guess what? You're being controlled already. You're already everything is being dictated to you already. What on earth are you talking about? Control and dictate. In fact, you know, the first one that said you're controlling me and you're trying to dictate to me was Satan. He said that about Father. He's the first one who said his pastor was being over bearing and it wasn't right and he went around with this propaganda and he was able to deceive the mighty host of angels an innumerable number of angels undefinable number of angels who stood beholding the glory of God and being his ministers for who knows how long how effective is he at his de deception? Our only place, our only hope of defense is the word of God. It's a light unto our path. It's how we're going to live. We're going to have to recognize that Satan's chief thing is rebelling against all authority. That's what he did. He started it. He's the first one who led a church split. And everybody who follows him does the same kind of things and has the same kind of behavior. Now, if we could just get this kind of discernment to recognize, here's our pro one of our problems. We think that we're brighter than we, we are. We think we're smarter than we are. We think we have a, a keen ability to analyze the situation and deduce the correct judgment. 
This is why you said this about me. These are, this is why these particular sets of very subjective circumstances really was pointed back to the root cause right here because you don't like me. You wanted to do something bad to me or you're, you know, being whatever, right? Nonsense. We've got to come to grips with the reality that that is a demonic suggestion from a demonic world, and we're coming under the influence of oppressive evil spirits. And at some point, we're going to say, look, I'm tired of fellowshipping with demons and being influenced by angels of darkness whose purpose is to destroy me and the family and everything about our life. I'm, I'm done. I want to commune with angels and walk with the Holy Ghost and get blessed from here on out. Okay. Yeah, so... Yeah, come on in. Come on in. Find a seat. I, I just, because I can, don't walk in front of the camera if you don't mind. You know, I, listen, I want, you to, I want you to understand the value, the value of doing it God's way. I want you to totally engage in doing it God's way. Because this is the biggest enemy of your success. It is the biggest enemy of your maturation. It's the biggest enemy of you being able to hear the most wonderful voice that has ever uttered a word, who is God himself. He wants to speak to you. He wants to love on you. He wants to bless you. He wants to make you more than, he wants to cause you to live more than a, just a mere human existence. He wants you to live out the beautiful, wonderful, glorious life that he himself has. If there's any example of, of the life of God, Besides the individual person yielded to Christ Jesus, it's the family. It's mom and dad. It's husband and wife. The Lord Jesus, he is the light of life. In other words, he's the one who shows us what the life really looks like. He's the visible representation of it, the only one in the midst of darkness. And when that life of God shines, the world is lit up. He says to you and I, and gives us a responsibility to live as the light to the world. But to do so, we're going to have to be willing to do it God's way. And so I want to start here tonight, now taking, just backing up a little bit. I've already started, actually. Uh, on, 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 um, I'm just looking here at, at the introduction. I, you, you see in your handout, uh, marriage made in heaven. Everyone who wants a marriage made in heaven, everyone wants a marriage made in heaven but there must be a commitment to keep it in heaven. And so I just want to quickly look at with you at the heavenly model. And um, reality of it is, uh, when we begin to look at this heavenly model, somebody have a Bible that I can use so I don't have to use my iPad? Anybody have a Bible? Did you guys show up with your Bibles? Yes. No, a few people so showed up with their Bibles. What Bible do you have? This is a pretty good Bible. Yeah. It's, got a, it's got big enough letters for me to see it. Pretty good. <laughs> Um, go with me to Ephesians in chapter 5, and you probably guessed that. Um, and, and I'm going to hit you with some pretty, pretty challenging things, okay? And I, I watch as, I watch as a, a, a lot of women in the church interact with their husbands clearly out of a demonic realm influenced by a feminist movement, humanist movement, movement, purely American culture. Who do you think you are? You're trying to subvert me. Huh? You don't let me breathe. If you love me, you'll take me like I am. Okay? All these things are just total manifestations of a demonic realm. It's true. It will t destroy your relationship. It will erode at it. And worse, worse than that, you are not going to be light into the world. There's not going to be any example of Christ Jesus living in your house. You can say all you want to say, but reality of it is, is you're not going to raise up in your home prophets and prophetess. You're not going to raise up in your house kingdom of God people because Satan is allowed in due to wrong relationships, okay? 
And um, right here, let's look at the right relationship. And the right relationship, the Lord lays it out for us in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the Lord. You must understand, here's what God says. He's saying, woman, women, look at how Sarah interacted with Abraham. She called him Lord. She called him Master. Can you hear the uprising of the feminist movement? you got to be kidding me. They're filing out right now and making placards to go and demonstrate outside. They're calling 911 for help at this very moment. you got to be kidding me. One person said to me, my goodness, you're, you're out of your mind. You are from, you're from the Middle Ages. No, 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 I'm not from the Middle Ages. I go much further back than that. I'm from the Bible Ages, okay? And, and somebody, oh, our culture is not like this. Women aren't ignorant. Women have never been ignorant. They've always been the brightest and most beautiful of all God's creation. I mean, women have always been smarter than guys. I mean, that isn't the issue. It's just that the issue is the strength of a woman within the framework of bringing forth and mentoring and developing living souls that had never existed before. Oh, look at you barefooting in the kitchen. I knew it. You were a male chauvinist. No, no, that's a lie right out of the pit of hell, screaming out against God's divine order and plan. It's an undermining of everything Father has purposed. It is, to, it is a complete reduction uh, uh, to a, a very trivial state of a human being's life that was shaped and molded in the womb from the, and, and has its first breath of existence when it comes into this world for the purpose of being developed to be a soul, a living being that rules and reigns with God forever and ever. And there is nobody who has that impact, that maternal impact. No one has that shaping, developing power like the mom. No one. She, that child is drawn from her breast. She will influence and impact that soul more than it. More than dad. Dad has his proper role. Dad is the security. Dad is the protector. Dad is the disciplinarian. Dad is the guy who brings direction for the future. But mom molds the identity, the purpose, the security, the, the, the vision of one's own self. It can't happen. It can't happen out of the right context. And that's why Paul talks about women be keepers of home. Rule your own house well. I mean, we can go through the list, and we're going to go through the list. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to look at the list. And, 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 and when you look at the list, my dear friends, <laughs> it's going to be hard for you to say, I'm going to have children and work outside the home and give, somebody, give your children for somebody else to raise. It's going to be hard for you to recognize or to rather to deny that anything that you do in defiance against your leadership will not be absolutely 100% times maybe 100 replicated in your child because everybody produces after their own kind both genetically, fe fe genotypically, and phenotypically, and spirotypically. <laughs> Physically, the outward appearance, the inward genetics, genome, and the spiritual. Everybody produces after their own kind. What kind are you? You and I are supposed to be the Jesus kind. We're supposed to be the Holy Ghost kind. We're supposed to be the living Word of God kind. This is what the world is waiting to see. As I said, as I quoted early on, here's a woman who's a leader in the militant feminist movement saying that our society neuters neuters men of their maleness, neuters young boys of their maleness at a very early age. Our culture will not allow women to understand what it means to be womanly. There is a sinister plan that is clearly definable and quantitative going on right now in our society. And the church is going to have to get some wisdom and some insight. We're going to have to understand how to come out from among them, be separate. We're going to have to understand how to get enough authority to step up and say, we're going to bring change to society. We're going to bring change to culture because we're going to live out the word of God. We have no authority to do anything when we're not walking ourselves in obedience to our head and our leadership. So here's what it comes down to. Women, here's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to interact with your husband just like you interact with Jesus. That's what that scripture just said. 
husbands, submit yourself to your own wives as unto the Lord. So women, you're going to have to quit expecting it. Huh? Now, I'm at the point in my life, and I'm going to be just right straightforward with you, that I'm ready to let my wife decide everything. <laughs> I'm 55 years old now, and I recognize that she always makes better decisions than I do. But she has never forced that on me. She's never in any way tried to make that a point of argument. She's ne and never has there been any competition in our love relationship because there's not competition in love relationship. And women, the guy can't compete with you because he's the leader. You have to compete with him. It's by default. It won't function any other way. So if you've got competition going on, which always produces strife, <laughs> you've got to understand you're not willing to take on this place of walking in love and, and, and servitude and obedience to your husband. As you obey Christ. Now, here's what Paul does. He really helps us. Because he says, okay, well, look, you know what? Maybe, some, maybe, maybe somebody messed up on the translation of these words. Okay? Maybe we need to go back and reevaluate translation. So what Paul does and what the Scripture does for us always is the Scripture always gives us an example, a living type, so we don't mess up in, tra in translation. We're not, we're not cornered by some word or, or confused by some, you know, parsing of verbs. He says very clearly, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Now, we can begin to go and look at all the ways in which Paul, and we don't have to go beyond Paul, we could go beyond Paul and look at that, that same word and typology and application in other epistles and, and, and books of the Bible. But number one, we understand headship is leadership, right? We, had, we understand headship is governorship. We can understand that even by just a classical definition. But here the Lord tells you and I that the relationship that's going on between a husband and a wife is defined between the relationship of Christ Jesus and the church. Now, how much is the church supposed to argue with Jesus? Huh? How, how much fault are we supposed to find with Jesus? How much are we supposed to minimize the leadership? Oh, well, stop, stop, stop right there because, I mean, goodness, Jesus is God and his, right, his leadership is going to be accurate all the time. You ought to understand this knucklehead I'm married to. He huh? ought to say this guy. He, he couldn't, he, you know, I'm not going to get into all of this stuff. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. What you're missing out on is what God does in the gifting and the empowerment of those that he anoints. See, nobody is gifted to be a pastor out of the natural. It's not have anything to do with have anything to do with my education. It has nothing to do with with my ability and my insight as a human being. God gives me an anointing to do what it is He's purposed me to do in His divine order. No one has born with the gifting to be a prophet or an apostle or you know or a king like Saul was. Saul received a special anointing, a man of God who is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, who marries a woman and wants to do the right thing, receives an anointing to be the head of the house. He receives an anointing, just like a king receives an anointing to be king, just like a prophet receives an anointing to be king, uh, to be a prophet, just like a priest receives an anointing to be a priest, like a pastor receives an anointing to be a pastor, like a person who has a working of miracles receives an anointing, a special gifting to do miracles, to walk on water, <laughs> to do things that it's just impossible. And if you, you can't reduce it. You cannot reduce the things of God to a purely human model. You can't say it's all about purely human responses and human conditioning and human experience. Because then that is to deny what God is doing in this equation. You, you, you can't reduce a child being conceived in the womb to some physical event only that happens between a man and woman. It is a miracle work of divine grace. And God has a big purpose in that child. And he knows that it's, that child will only develop properly and be what he's purposed and called it to be for all eternity if we obey what he says for us to do. 
and teach our children then. Which I must help you understand this. Mom and dad's actions speak far loud, uh, much, much louder than words. The kisses and the hugs are in front of the kids are more impacting than anything else. It's more important than food on, their, on the table and clothes on their back. Because it's the quality of emotional well-being, spiritual stability. To grab a hold of this. And most people would not just take, um, hopefully uh, very few people, would take, uh, you know, some instrument of torture and start whacking their kid with it on a daily basis. But, but arguments and strife and problems within the relationship does exactly that spiritually and emotionally because mom and dad don't want to grow up. They want to remain as in sibling rivalry. I've, we've, we've even uh, witnessed where, you know, some marriages, they, people just want to be roommates, you know. You, it's just it's wrong. It's inappropriate. You can't do that. I, listen, I've been here with people, and I've, I've said to this, I said, listen, if your marriage, your problems in your marriage are going to be solved, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to stop doing what you're doing and simply do it God's way. I've looked at people and I've said to women, honor your husband from this day forward. Respect him. You cannot disrespect him anymore. And I've seen some women just perk right up, say, I'm going to do that because that's what God says for me to do. I'm supposed to honor and I'm supposed to reverence my husband. Reverence. I'm going to get to that word. Reverence. I'm going to get to that one. It's to hold sacred. It's to hold in highest of honor. It's the last word in Ephesians chapter 5. It's the last word. The last word. Amen. Last word, the big word. I got the, Father's got the last word. And I've watched it cure. I've watched it cure many ailments, many diseases, many demonic powers. See, because demonic power is going to come against your marriage. It's going to still come against your marriage. What you have to have is you have to have a defense to stop it. Now, the defense to stop it is obedience to the Word of God, submission to the Word of God, submission to the ways of God. Then Father comes out, and He's our protector, and He's our defender. However, if we don't obey God's Word, the demonic attack comes, and we're going to still be back in the same situation we're in. And, hey, I've been in counseling now for 120 years, and nothing's changed. Yeah, nothing's going to change, because you decide how you're going to be different. Nothing, no one can change you except for God, and He's not going to do it unless you give Him permission. You have to be willing to do it. And then, then you have to be willing, once he changes you, now to walk in that change. And so you decide, change yourself then, after he steps in and changes you. We say, well, look, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give it up and give it over to the Lord. When I look at my life, and I, when I look around in my life, and I see blessings, okay, in my life, I, and, I, and I pause and I think, how did I get so blessed? I'm always conscious at that moment that all I simply did was obey God, do the right thing. It's easier to do the right thing than it is to do the wrong thing. It really truly is. Here, doing the right thing, we get to walk with angels, we get to commune with angels and walk with the Holy Spirit. Doing the wrong thing, we get tormented, afflicted, and tossed by demon spirits and under the control of someone who hates us so much we cannot even begin to comprehend. Do the right thing. Come on, just do the right thing. Are you with me? I've said to other people, I've said, you will not. I recently said this to a person with this, with this level of voice. Do not disrespect your husband or dishonor your husband anymore. And they drove away mad because they don't believe that that's true. I'm all whatever. Huh? Well, is it me? Is it a philosophy? Is it a certain group of people from the Middle Ages? Or is it the Word of God? Listen, you want to have a right relationship? Don't, listen, don't get married unless you're going to have children. You get married to have children. That's what God says. Period. Well, we're going to get married to not have children. I don't understand that. That isn't divine order. The Lord didn't do it for that reason. He said he, he, he did not create a man from a woman. As strange as that may be to you. Huh? He created the woman from the man. 
he drew out of the man's life and produced a woman. A woman owes her life to the man. That's what Paul lays that, lays that out in, 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 in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Pretty radical, isn't it? Can you hear the movement? I mean, the feminists are up in arms right now. Humanists are up in arms. Intellectuals are up in arms. It can't be that way. No, we're on an equal basis. Not on an equal basis. Is the, not, in, not in the sense of, of, of a leadership. Did Christ Jesus make us one with him? Yeah, isn't that beautiful? Is he still Lord? Is he still our head? Is he still our leader while we're one with him? Are we going to tell him what to do? Say, look, you know, Lord, you just, look. I mean, I like the most of everything about you, but there's a couple of things that really need to be changed here. We need to work on this. You know, this fire in your eyes and a few other things. <laughs> it just isn't acceptable. And we're not going to do that. We love him. We love him. We're holding great honor. He's God. He'll always be God. He's made us one with him. He's brought us into, and we've got to be careful with saying it. He's brought us into, and we almost hush when we say it, He's brought us into uh, uh, being co-laborers. He brought us into being heirs together with him, which is like, ooh. How, how is this? He's brought us into oneness. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. He's given us everything that he has. It's amazing. But he's still in charge. You know, I'm so glad that, I'm so glad, I love my wife, but I'm so glad that my name is not Mark Harding. I didn't get married and become Mark Harding. That's my wife's maiden name. I got, my wife got, I stay kept my name because the Lord ordained the patriarchal leadership of the family that exists in every society in the world today because he ordained it that way. He made the man, the priest, and the one who is responsible for all his family and even for all humankind. Thus, Adam's transgression hit his family and hit extended family to this very day. The man was, not, not because of what Eve did, not because of what Eve did. Paul lays that out in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Not because of what Eve did. Eve is deceived. And understanding that dynamic of a woman without leadership by the dynamic that the Lord shows us has a susceptibility, potentially a susceptibility. And if I'm going to say that a woman is the weaker vessel, you're going to hear me now. I only know the woman as a weaker vessel within the framework of susceptibility to deception. As Eve was, as is modeled for us, and as Paul took it up, even so much as he said, I will not allow a woman to teach. Okay? She can prophesy. Huh? She can minister and flow in the Holy Ghost. Because remember, in the Holy Ghost, it's neither male nor female. It's neither, it's neither Jew or Gentile. We are one in the Holy Ghost. There's a, there's, a, there's a freedom and a liberty for women to have every gifting and, and to be able to function in every demonstration of the Holy Ghost. But Paul says you can't teach. You cannot take the position of bringing forth revelation, distilling revelation and direction for the body of Christ and for the church. Are you with me? That belongs to the office that only exists within the framework of what a man, God has anointed a man to do. Somebody says, well, I get it. What we do it? Because God didn't anoint you. He did not anoint you to do it. Are you with me? Because yeah. nobody gets to do anything unless they first receive it from heaven. So you don't get to do it because God didn't anoint you to do it. But look at all the other things he anointed you to do. Yeah. Huh? Aren't you happy? Yeah. I'm happy. Unless you got all kind of, well, you saying we inferior? That's, that's, the, that's a demonic accusation. And nobody said inferior, nothing. Huh? Man and a wife are heirs together of the grace of God. A man needs to know how to live with his wife according to knowledge. In other words, he cannot let her run the house, run over top of him, usurp authority. He cannot let her go on in rebellion and dissension. He cannot. He cannot. Any more than a 
pastor can let dissension and rebellion run rampant in the church or allow other inappropriate things like people coming in in fornication and adultery and uncleanness and witchcraft and sedition. He can't allow it. God ain't going to allow it. He, Jesus is going to come rule with a rod of iron. He's going to smash the vessels is what he says. That's what he says. He, the greatest, the greatest enemy, listen to me, People concerned about divorce, and you should be. We hate divorce. God hates divorce. But he divorced. And because, and because Hagar started striving against her, her mistress, her master, really, Sarah, she set up in her spirit and in her attitude because she was creating strife and tantalizing and dishonoring Sarah, what she was doing was creating the same effect in Ishmael against Isaac. The Lord says, cast her out. Divorce her right now. She's out of here because of strife and rebellion. Rebellion, living in strife and rebellion is far worse than divorce. Accommodating rebellion, accommodating things that are clearly unholy things. Huh? Huh? And, and I have many things to say about that. I'm not going to say them tonight. Um, I just want to, I'm not going as far as I wanted to get. I'm, I'm trying to limit this to an hour. I, I, I'm, want to, I'm wanting to passionately lay a foundation. Women, I want you to have a very clear model of how you're supposed to interact with your husbands. You're supposed to interact with your husbands like the church interacts with Jesus. That will honor Father, and Father will then come on your side, and I don't care if the gates of hell come out against you. He's going to take and change everything and rearrange it on your account because you got his favor because you obey in him. Huh? You try to be the arm of flesh can do nothing. People are always trying to fix things. You and I, and from a human point of view, from the arm of flesh, we only make things worse. Only God. It's not by might. It's not by power. Only God. Only the power of the Holy Ghost can change things. Women, do what's right. Do what's right from the point of honoring your husband, respecting him, doing those things which the Lord said to do, obeying him, letting him, empowering him, helping him to be the leader by always saying, by, by always saying yes and agreeing and standing behind him. I think I made a lot of bad decisions, but every one, my wife started very on when I, in, in my, by the measure of true evaluation, was far from perfect. I could be classified. She could have said I was imperfect with all kinds of problems. She called me Mark, the perfect man. She empowered me. Every day she empowered me. Every day she participated with the word of God and she saw and, and, and loved me on the basis of who God made me as her leader, as the man of God, as a, a person who was anointed of the Lord to, to be the patriarch of a family for a legacy of greatness, to do great things in the kingdom of God now and throughout eternity. Wow, women, don't you realize that that's why a man leaves a father and mother and cleaves unto his wife? Because as he received identity and purpose from the father and the mother, now he's able to receive that same kind of purpose and strength and identity and empowerment from the wife. It's amazing. It really is. It's not like that the man leaves his father and mother no longer to honor his father and mother to go, you know, do what his wife said to do. And I really recently heard that interpretation. I'm going, my, interesting. So now the man leaves his father and his mother and goes and cleaves unto his wife so that now he may obey her and do whatever she says for him to do. That is very demonic. And he became not, he didn't, she didn't become Mr. what his name was. He became Mrs. what her name is. Now I present unto you Mrs. Huh? It would have been terrible if I would have been standing there and they said, now I present unto you Mrs. Mark and Ann Harding. Because then that's the leader. That describes the leadership. That describes a new name, a new identity. 
Somebody said, are you saying, are you, I, I can hear what you're getting at. You're saying that the woman should lose her identity and her whole, uh, whole identity should be in her husband. You're very perceptive because that is exactly what I'm saying. Because just like the church is supposed to lose its whole identity and have its whole identity in Christ Jesus, so the woman with the man. And now you got yourself a team. You don't have two heads. You got one head. Praise God. We tired. The world is scared to death of us because we're walking around with many heads. What has two heads? A mutant. What has no head? A monster. Oh, we're just going to be, we're going to, you know, we're gonna, we just got this recent new hot off the press book about the art of compromise. The art of compromise should have been subtitled that which Satan developed. Okay? <laughs> because compromise is totally demonic. It has nothing to do with the kingdom of God, the way of God. God demands agreement. Compromise is a tool of Satan to ultimately bring you to a place of defeat. Are you listening to me? Agreement. So, is the, so women, is your husband supposed to agree with you? If you love me, you would agree with me. And he's supposed to look at you and say, woman, repent right now. <laughs> now, let's honor the Lord here. Let's honor God here now. Stop that. Stop that. You don't, you don't care about me. Stop that. Here's the church. Jesus, you don't care about us. <laughs> That's bringing an accusation against God. How is that going to work out? How is that going to ultimately result in the favor of the Lord being upon that church? How is, how is the Holy Spirit going to hook up with that and begin to bring joy and peace and healing and His manifest glory and His blessings to those who are totally undeserving of it? We're totally undeserving of it. We're just simply willing to obey God. And because we're willing to obey, He then puts all of these glorious things upon us that go way beyond anything we're ever worthy of or ever deserving of. And He's amazing, isn't He? Are you getting this? Yeah. Women are never going to argue again. You're going to empower your husband to be leader. Huh? And guess what? I'm going to tell you right now. It has stunned him. It has stunned him. It will. It has stunned him. He's like, what? You're not saying anything. What's the silence? Are you upset? No, I'm very happy. I'm just praising God that he's anointed you to be the leader of our house. Because I know that a special anointing of his grace is going to result in us ending up at the right place and being blessed and having everything that pertains to life and godliness and every good and perfect gift and all the wonderful things that belong to this inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus. I'm so excited about what God's doing. I am a beneficiary of that. Listen, women, I'm telling you, I am so I'm, I'm so strong on this because the Lord blessed me with such a gift in my wife. And it's, somebody said to me one time, that, wow, my, you really did a great job with your children. I said, my wife. It's amazing how your family turned out. My, my wife. Yeah, but you did something. Well, yeah, here's what I did. I obeyed God, followed God, and did it God's way. And... When I didn't do it God's way, my wife did not accuse me, did never point the finger at me, never blamed me for any wrongdoing, never blamed me for a bad consequence. If she had anything to say, she went in her prayer, prayer closet and talked to the Lord about it. That's probably why she never let me go to her prayer closet with her. <laughs> I like to try to find my wife. Where is she? And if I found, if I discovered her prayer place, she would change it. <laughs> And I'm like, what? I mean, you know, if I've ever felt any slight bit of rejection from my wife, it said, it's like the prayer closet time. I want to hang out and listen to your prayers. She doesn't want me to, she doesn't want me to pray. She does grace me with a prayer to where we pray together, you know, but she's got her time. But the only time my wife wanted alone, she never, you know, apart from me was a time, just her, her time to go and just get into a place of prayer. And I knew she was in a place of prayer because she came out shining with love and grace and mercy, not... <laughs> Is that ever appropriate? No. So there's situations where women have to be the leader to some degree spiritually because her husband's not walking with the Lord. And they chose to remain. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says that the unbelieving husband or the unbelieving wife, and I'm going to say one who acts like an unbeliever. You say you believe, but if you disobey God and don't walk with God, you're an unbeliever. If the unbelieving husband or unbelieving wife wants to depart, let him depart. You've not sinned. Okay? But 
if you're willing and they're willing to stay with you, continue. Because you can, you can reach them. You can, you can see them come into the kingdom. I'm just going to paraphrase, okay? I'm going to bring it down into modern vernacular. And besides that, your prayers sanctify your house. Wow. Man, what happens when husband and, 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 and wife who are walking in divine order, who they both love God, they both want to serve God. Listen, women, you're going to make a big difference on how your husband serves God. I've heard too many men say, I'd walk with God and my, my, my wife wasn't constantly berating me. I could, I could somehow find a footing with the Lord if my wife wasn't constantly telling me how bad off I am. I just can't take it anymore. I mean, just imagine constantly being living under constant criticism. I don't want to imagine that. Ima because then I would have to imagine Jesus living under constant criticism from the church. I'm not going to imagine that. I'm going to say, buddy, you need to stand up and tell that woman to shut up and sit down. Well, if I do that, she's going to leave. Fine. Let the unbelieving depart. You've not sinned. Tell her to shut up and sit down. Well, I thought you were supposed to be helping us work this thing out. So we can get. I'm, I want everybody to simply submit to the kingdom of God's culture because you cannot fix something that's wrong or broken in that sense. It's wrong. It's not really broken. It's just wrong. You can't fix something that's wrong. You can't fix the devil. You can't fix sin. You understand what I'm saying? When God changes us, fills us with his love. Who's going to say, you know, who, 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 who's going to begin to be the judge of who's more mature? Well, I'm more mature than him. He just got saved yesterday. And I've been walking with the Lord for 100 years. <laughs> well, when he got, you don't understand, when he got saved yesterday, the Lord gave him an anointing and he never gave you, honey. Don't you understand that? You got to be kidding me. No, he did. He gave, you, he gave him an anointing. Just like he gave Saul an anointing. Did he give anybody else in Israel? He gave your husband an anointing. At that day, he got saved. And now he's smarter than you are, even though you've been walking with the Lord for 100 years. He has the divine ability and grace. But if you don't participate with God's program, you will invalidate that. You will act as a hindrance against it. Most churches and most Christians never flow in the anointing that God has given them because of satanic hindrances. Watch out. You can be a hindrance against your husband flowing in the anointing and the mantle that God gave him a special anointing to be able to lead into all blessings, everything that pertains to life and godliness, to wealth, every good and perfect thing. Watch out now. Don't be a hindrance. Be, participate with it. Get right on alongside of him. Be the one who, as Aaron, uh, helped to hold up the hands of Moses. Be the one who helped hold up his hands. Be the, be the one who's his... Biggest encourager every day. Be like the Holy Ghost to him. Huh? Behave yourself like the Holy Spirit. Be a comforter. Be a supporter. Say, I know we're going to get this done. I know God's going to fix this thing. I know this is going to work. I think there was only one time that I had to strongly correct my wife. And, and, it, and it was because it was an area of, and I, and I, and I bring this out because I really want to make it's very clear what I'm saying, okay? That leadership demands that you correct when there's wrong things going on. But you better do it right because your head is Christ Jesus. And that's his daughter that you're correcting. So you better be right. And so then it was just the issue of, you know, not getting into fear over finances. Be, you know, when, when, you know, my wife, she was raised very nice and very comfortably in La Jolla and had everything and now I'm stepped out here and we don't have anywhere near enough. And she's great at the details and she's very, very diligent about everything. I mean, you know, our alarm went off last night, the smoke detector at midnight and woke us all up. So we're working to get the things pull together for the alarm, you know, get that thing shut off. What's my wife doing? She's taking dishes out of the dishwasher. I'm going, my goodness, baby. Because <laughs> that's just the way she is. She's very d diligent about everything. Let nothing, she lets nothing go. And be with, with you know, the, the wisdom and the insight that the Lord's given her and all the, you know, things about calculating. She's like, 
we don't have enough. I said, no, no, no big deal. Well, what do you mean by no big deal? See, I was raised in, in a church. I was raised in pastor's home. I knew about faith. Just call in. You call it in, it's no big deal. If it's a big deal, you can't call it in. If there's fear, you can't call it in. And so I said, no big deal. Don't worry about it. And then she didn't really listen to me. She just accepted it. Oh, okay, she smiled. No big deal. Don't worry. But she basically biting her fingernails going, oh, God, we're perishing. <laughs> and then so one day I had to say, I said, what's going on here? I, I, said, I said, wait a minute. The provision isn't coming. Something's wrong around here. And so I'm like asking around kind of thing. What's going on? I'm asking the Lord. I'm asking her. And then she came out with it, you know. Well, I, and, and she, I've been breaking out in hives over this thing. And fear. I said, you don't understand. When you do that, you shut down the supply of faith. That has to be corrected. Don't do that anymore. And so she said, well, what do I do? I said, just hide behind me. Hide right here behind me. I'll protect you. Hide right here behind me. Stay right behind me. Trust me. One night we were driving home in the fog. And I drive fast in the fog. Because I can see the yellow line. And I'm confident. I pray in Holy Ghost. And I want to get there. And she's like just fretting. And there was an avocado. I picked the avocado up, put it in her hand, said, hold the avocado. It would be all right. It made her, it made her laugh so hysterically, right, that she lost all fear. She's never been a problem, a problem ever again because the Lord gave me a wisdom, word of wisdom to make something, a joke out of it to where she felt secure and not just... Because <laughs> she was in a car accident when she was 12, 13 years old. And, you know, if I were a, a more sensitive caring person, I would have said she was in an accident when she was 13 years old and slowed down. But because I'm not as caring and sensitive as maybe I ought to be, because I'm a strong leader. Huh? Now, what do you want? You want a strong leader or you want caring and sensitive? Okay? Caring and sensitive. Because a lot of times it takes a strong leader a long time to become caring and sensitive. Just the way it is. But you know what? Me being strong and not caring and sensitive, I got a Holy Ghost anointing and a Father who's going to protect me. Angels go before me. And I haven't, not, haven't had any wreck. And I don't need to knock on wood. <laughs> because it wasn't the wood that kept me. And once some superstitious thing that made this work out, it's the Holy Ghost going with me. And so now my wife can recognize, oh, well, he might not be sensitive and caring, but he sure is anointed. And God's taking care of him. Okay, you're going to have to spend the thing. And I'm trying to just help here with my own, you know, personal experiences to recognize, look, if, you, if anybody thinks for a second, you know, that in any way I was perfect in a relationship and that's why it's so good at my house. I'm telling you, I want to bring you out of your, you know, bubble. I mean, I, I, I posted on a, my Facebook not too long ago that my wife empowered me as a very young husband in calling me the perfect man. And to this day, she, she'll tell you that she, she's never spoken a bad word about me, not to me or to anyone else. That's so beautiful. I get to see Jesus. She's never complained about nothing. Why? She's made him. She's made my head her head. And because my head is her head, it's easy for, easy for her to honor me. And husbands, understand, you're going to have to be the most caring and sensitive you can be. It's not about how fast you're driving in the fog. It's about how attentive you are to obeying God's word and doing what's right. Look. No husband is supposed to have to earn trust. It's already given. That's a relationship, okay? And you can certainly help boister the confidence in your wife when she sees you putting God first. I'm going to put God first. Come hell or high water, we going to church. My wife's always adored it. did not matter. We we're on our honeymoon. We're going to church. She saw it from the very beginning. We're going to church. God's first. This is the way it's going to be. Huh? One time she, she, she just hinted at, well, maybe, n no, 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 maybe. But we're, no. Okay. <laughs> we're, do, we're doing, who are we, uh, what are we about? We're about the kingdom of God. We're going to walk in God's word. We're going to honor the Lord. I've never had to deal with some of the things that some men have to deal with. I've never had to deal with my wife being honorary and argumentative. I never had to deal with that. But men, you have to deal with it. And women, you're going to have to, wives, you're going to have to listen.
You're going to say, you're right. I shouldn't be talking that way. Huh? But when your husband said, all you're doing is you're cursing yourself. All you're doing is you're bringing problems upon your own head. Because what's coming out of your mouth are things that have nothing to do with what the Holy Spirit is saying. It's nothing to do with the Word of God. It has to do with everything that's fearful, everything that belongs to an imagination of the worst possible kind, or even of a negative nature. Don't do that. Men, you are responsible to watch and govern your house to make sure that it's under divine order. Now, if that's going to be true, then you yourself need to walk in divine order. And women, if he's not got it yet, don't harass him and beat him up and criticize him for it and berate him for it. Go to your knees and let's see if you've got any power with God. Huh? And, and I guarantee you, if you do that, Father put his favor on you. Yeah, he'll work on your behalf. And he'll step in. He'll step in. Husbands, let me tell you something. You have the greater accountability. Be sure of this. You will give an account to God in a way that your wife will never have to give an account to God. You will. You will give an account for your seed, for your generations to come, how you led your house, how you ruled your home. The fact of it is, as Scripture says, unless a man can rule his own house, and I'm going to use that word just like it is, rule, R U L E, rule. And that one is the same in every language. The full impact of the word is implied. Like God rules us, men rule your own home. Because if you can't rule your own home, you can't rule the house of God. And I'm going to rule the house of God. And people can criticize me for it. And they can say all these kinds of, doesn't matter. I have to give an account to my head. Okay? You have, as women, you have to give an account to your head, your husband. Amen? And what's going to happen is if you do it right, if you do these things right, if you just obey God, if you'll trust him, he'll fix the problem. He'll work a miracle. He'll solve it. He'll solve it over and again. I, I, we've been in situations in our house. It wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. But we needed growth. And I call, I call the fire. I say, Father, let your fire come upon us. Let your fire come on this house right now. Because I need change. My wife needs change. My kids need change. The house needs change. The circumstances need change. Everything needs change. And we know what brings the change. The fire of his presence and always brings the change. That's what we get to do. I'm anointed to do that. Men, you're anointed to do that. Men, you're anointed to take a hold of faith and trust God in such a way that your wives are able then to step up into a whole other realm of faith. And there's no question about it. When there's not a man around to do it or not a man not willing to do it, God will raise up a Deborah. He'll do it just like because there's no man to do it. God will raise up a Mariah Woodworth at her because there was no man to do it. Hallelujah. Praise God. One of the greatest champions of miracles and signs and wonders the 20th century, 19th and 20th century woman. Praise God for that. Amen. Huh? So it isn't, it isn't, you know, in any way, we're not talking about a demotion of women. We're talking about a promotion. Even as the church was promoted when Christ Jesus, see, Christ Jesus died for us so that we could be empowered to follow him. He didn't die for us at Calvary's cross and raise again so we would be empowered to continue to live the same terrible life that we were living and be right with God now because then Satan's got to be saved too. And every devil and every, un, uh, you know, every wicked thing. Are you with me? He empowered us to be able to follow him. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I praise God to have a better life. Isn't that great? W women, wives, that's what happened. You were in, you married someone who was now anointed by God with a special <clears throat> gifting so that you now may be empowered to walk in a greater manifestation of the power of God in your own life. And then the beautiful thing of it is, is what the Lord has reserved for the woman to bring forth an eternal being who never existed before, who God calls his inheritance, who's given those children on loan to dad and mom. They belong to him. It's his reward. I finished reading this. I've gone way too long. Sorry about that. Very excited about this. The model. Don't compromise the model. Can I say this again? Do not compromise the model. You want to, I'm telling you, I don't care how unfair you might think it is. That is an unfair that is based upon a wrong set of criteria. Because if your criteria is a judgment of God, it is absolutely the right thing to do. 
If your criteria is based upon humanism, the worldly culture, society, the influences of the demonic world, charged with the atmosphere of unholiness, then yeah, it's unfair by that criteria. At the very bottom of this page, I talk about disposition. And I just want to say, women of God, you hold the key. Give yourself to being happy and making your husband happy and watch as the family and the church lights up in the beauty of heaven. It's a, everybody says, happy wife, happy life, because everybody knows it's true. But who's the source of your happiness, women? Huh? Who's the source of your happiness? And you've got to really just decide that. Is it, it, do you, what, where do you gain your real self-worth and approval? I know your desire shall be unto your husband and he shall rule over you in it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the context of this model later. But where's the real source of your happiness? If you're trying to get things from your husband that he can't supply, watch out. Because the thing about it is, there's the, the when, look, it's so easy to receive joy and love and peace from the Holy Ghost. Come on now. Come on. Huh? And somebody said, well, I just, you know, I've, I've heard it so many times. Well, I've just got to get love before I can give it. Okay. <laughs> I can see that. Friend, the perspective of you getting and receiving love from the Holy Ghost before you can give it. But I, I heard too many times it applied to a husband. That's nonsense. Stop it right there. You misunderstand the whole dynamics of the relationship. Okay? All that is Satan running interference. The love is already there. You got married. Amen. Amen. How many times got to tell you that he loves you today? Uh, where do you get your security from? Men are supposed to give the wives security as much as Christ Jesus did, does give us security. Christ Jesus clearly has told us he loves us over and over again, and I believe in that. You know, I think it's good for a husband to tell his wife that he loves her as many times as he kisses her in a day, and that should be many. Anybody got a problem with that? <laughs> because once again, that's the other side of it. Christ Jesus. But if what if he doesn't? I'm not doing nothing until he does what, what pastor said. I want some kisses and some loves. And, <laughs> but that isn't the way, that isn't the way God has called us, called you to do it. Because he's called each of us to lay down our lives for one another. Because we're going to back up for both male and female, even outside of the dynamic of the of, of marital relationship. We're going to stand brother, sister in Christ, three dimensions to all relationships. Brother and sister in Christ first, friendship second, then spouse. And those three dynamics of the relationship should always be there every day, right? And the bottom line of it is you're supposed to be loving, laying down your life. And it can't be the, you know, standoff. Well, you first. Because then that's not real. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. This is how God ordained it. And no, women, you're not the neck. You're not the neck. I'm going to say this again. Oh, yeah, he's the head, but don't, don't forget, you're the neck. I don't see no neck there. The neck is part of the head. Uh-huh. If you, want, if, you, if you need a body part, it would be the rib. Yes, he's the head and you're the rib. If we're going to, if we're going to go biblical, you, but otherwise just understand, wait a minute, I just want to understand how, I want to understand, God's empowered me to be able to follow my leadership. I got to understand that Satan is the arch enemy of following leadership. I've got to understand that the atmosphere is charged with rebellion and defiance. You, I'm going to tell you, you stick with me on this. Some, for the, some of you, it may be hard. Of course, no one in here. Everybody watching by <laughs> the web or by YouTube. But stick with me. and The Lord will change your attitude. And your attitude will come into line with His attitude. You change your thinking realm on these 
in these things where the Word of God governs your thinking realm. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody said, if I could just get my heart hooked up with my thinking realm. No problem. I can do that. I can help you with that right now. People have been acting like, you know, it's some kind of mystery. Let the Word of God be that which exists in your thinking realm and be hooked up automatically with your heart. And we're good to go from here on out. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. I want you to just meditate on that, those two verse scriptures. Okay? Wives, submit yourself to your own husband just as you would submit yourself and just as you submit yourself to Jesus Christ. I can tell how much a woman is submitted to Christ Jesus by how much she is submitted to her husband. They are equivalent. They are, un they are equivalent. You're not going, you can make them, you can make them different if you want to. It's called stubbornness and rebellion. But God says they're equivalent. Right there in that verse of scripture and there's other verses of scriptures we could correlate with that. Underscore it with this. My husband is my leader. He's my leadership. He's my spiritual leadership. I want to be used by God. I want to walk in the Holy Ghost. I want to grow and develop. But if I'm not going to be willing to go according to God's proper order, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to grow. I'm not going to develop because I'm disconnected from my connection with Jesus. Women, I'm going to say it to you. God has anointed the connection. As much as the man cannot be connected to the Father without Jesus, the woman cannot be connected to Christ Jesus in a right, proper marriage relationship as it should be. I'm talking about a man's walking with, with the Lord. Okay? And, I, and, and once again, the only context where that shouldn't exist or could ex is because people married um, before they gave their life to the Lord, one got saved and the other didn't, okay? Or one backslid. And, there's, and I know what Ezra said about that. All of you who are married to the unbeliever, now you send them away with their children now so revival can come to Israel. Can you imagine that? We're going to have revival. Now, the man of God just stood up and said, all you guys that married women of the foreigners, have you ch have children of the foreigners, you divorce them now and send them away. Because then until you do, there's not going to be any move of God here in this place. Now what are you going to do? I, I, I hear people, I hear, I hear the howls and the cries. I'm laying it out here. Because there's been too much agreement with rebellion. Rebellion is taking over. Feminism is on the rise. It's being allowed because men are abdicating their place of authority. Pastors are abdicating their place of authority. We are being overrun by darkness. Satan has the upper hand. And it's got to stop. Men are going to have to find their seat of authority. They're going to have to find their place of leadership and rulership in Christ Jesus and begin to make a stand for what's right and not allow the problem anymore. We can say, look, this cannot be allowed now. We're going to be gracious and merciful and I, because I've, I've, I've been counseling for over 30 years and I've listened to the rap sheet that women bring against their husbands because I meet with them both and I meet with them separately. There's a giant rap sheet. I'm going, you know, this is wrong. The rap sheet is wrong. Are you listening to me? It is wrong. You're going to have to stop. So I try to help them. I try to help them understand. No, 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 no. This is wrong. This is wrong attitude. This is who he is. Rational is. All right. It's wrong. You can never be right being so wrong. It's wrong. Why don't you love him? Why don't you love him like Jesus loved you? Why don't you lay down your life for him? Why don't you quit speaking evil against your headship and your leadership? And I know people were saying, when are we going to get to the part where husbands are supposed to love their wives? <laughs> Did you notice that the Lord didn't start off with that? He didn't start off with that. Right, because he didn't start, that's right, he didn't start off saying, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church. He didn't start off that way. He started off according to divine order. Women, wives, 
Submit yourself to your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's how it starts. Oh, no, 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 no. We want it to start the other way. No. Here's how it starts. We're going to go with God's prioritization. It's divine order. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ that all these lying spirits, that all the powers of darkness, all the rebellion, all the influences of darkness that have charged the atmosphere with these lying things that have worked both in husbands and in wives, and wives and in husbands. Father, the men who've not been willing to walk with you and be the leaders that you've made them to be, they've not been willing to be the priest of the homes. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, that changes to begin with. Oh, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that, with the, the, that your daughters, your, the women of the church, will have the grace to pray and intercede until their husbands step into the priestly mantle that you gave to them, until they'll step into the anointing of leadership to lead their family, not into the world, not into a lost realm, but into the places of habitation in you. Hallelujah. Uh, that men will wake up and recognize that they are leading their children, even not only one generation, but in fact many generations. Where they're leading them either into falling out to the camp of darkness, to over being overwhelmed by the powers of, of this world and disobedience, or they're leading them into a place of walking with angels. Hallelujah. Fellowshipping with angels and walking in, but with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Father, pray in the name of Jesus that we'll awaken in your church. And no longer re allow rebellion, not in our own lives, nor in the lives of those that are around us. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I'm, by the help and the grace of the Lord, I'm going to do my very best next time. Because every other week we're doing order in the house. Every other week we're doing school of spirit. I'm going to try to keep it under an hour or keep it at an hour. Do 45 minutes of just talking about these things and then open it up for 15 minutes of questions and um, okay so if anybody has a real burning question right now I'm happy to answer that if it's a public question is it fair to put all the choices in the man's hand okay that's a good question it's a good question what we have to do to answer that question is we've got to turn to the word of God and we've got to say Real simply, this model that the Lord laid out for us clearly is as Christ Jesus and his church. So we can ask it this way. Is it fair for the church to put all of the questions and decisions in Christ Jesus' hand? Is it fair for the church to put all the decisions in Jesus' hands, all the directions of what we're going to do? And we would have to say yes. Okay, so then is it fair for the woman to say, okay, I'm going to put all the decisions in your hands. Okay? And, and, and here's one of the things that I, that I try to do uh, when I'm helping people in marriage counseling. I say to them, I walk them through the marriage vows, and I say, are you really willing to reverence and respect this guy? Do you believe and do you know him enough and believe in him enough that you can trust him that he's going to make the right decisions for your life because he's the decision maker? If you're not ready to do that, you're not ready to have the kind of marriage and say the kind of vows that God has laid out in his word. That's first and foremost. So it allows the woman to step back and say, wait a minute. Do I really believe that I'm going to take on, that this guy is going to ultimately be the identity that I'm going to have of myself and that I'm going to trust him enough to vow and commit my life to him to that extent to empower him to make all the decisions for our entire family and how we're going to live our lives. And once again, I'm going to offset that by recognizing, first and foremost, that the Lord gives the man a special anointing to do that. That's part of this whole dynamic of marriage. He empowered Adam to decide for all humanity where we're going to go. And Adam blew it. But nonetheless, Father empowered it and he didn't say, oops, I made a mistake, forget about that. Women, you're going to have the, use. I'm passing the baton to you now, you girls. You take it from here. Adam blew it. So now, you know, it's your time to step up. He didn't do that. He kept, amen? And then the second man, last man, amen. amen. The last man came. And the last man settled it for us, amen. amen. Father empowered the last man with all of the power to decide where this family's going. Amen. Amen. 
<laughs> Hallelujah. And he did a good job. Women empower your husband. God's empowered him. Huh? Can you participate with what Father's doing? Good. Any other question? Okay, well, we'll get at it again two weeks from now. Love all of you. Thank you for coming. Have a blessed rest of your life. <laughs> Do it God's way and have a blessed marriage. Be happy every day.